This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include former legislator Gene Arnold from Nash okay. County, Chris Fitzsimon from NC Policy Watch, John Hood from the John Locke Foundation, one of our favorite journalists, Cash Michaels from the Carolinian and from the Wilmington Journal. Yes, sir. Uh, New Hanover Journal. Well, I always get that confused. <laughs> We've got some Easter egg excitement for you, beginning with North Carolina becoming more urban and more Republican. Okay, that was pretty bad. <laughs> we'll talk about turf battles playing out between our legislature and our cities, whether it's time to resume executions of death row inmates and proposed changes in the lottery. We've got a full show, so let's get going. They say the only thing that remains the same is change, and North Carolina's proof of this According to recently released census data, 47 of our 100 counties lost population from 2010 to July of last year. Those losing the fastest are in the northeastern section. The raleigh Cary metropolitan area was the 13th fastest growing in the nation. In fact, Forbes magazine says it's the fastest growing metro area with hot spots of growth in Charlotte, the Triangle, Fort Bragg, and Wilmington areas. Not only are we more urban, but we've become more Republican. In 1970s, 70 of the 100 county governments were controlled by Democrats. Following the 2012 elections, only 46 have a majority of Democrats. John, we, we understand the population is moving to more urban areas, but help us explain why have Democrats seen such a dramatic shift in control of county governments? Well, uh, there have been two strong election cycles for Republicans in, the last, in 2010 and 2012. But there's a longer term trend going on too, going on here as well. One of them is in rural areas that used to be heavily Democratic but pretty conservative in their voting. A lot of those voters are now going ahead and voting for Republicans. You know, their granddads and grandmas are spinning in their graves. Something else that's going on is a difference in how the uh, people are sorting themselves in metropolitan areas. Republican-oriented voters are going to places like Union County outside of Charlotte or Johnston County outside of Raleigh. Uh, and those places that used to be Democratic have flipped Republican. Meanwhile, places like Mecklenburg County have actually become a bit more Democratic. Now, it turns out that Wake and Guilford counties are currently held by Republicans, but have recently been held by Democrats. And those urban counties are going to be competitive, not Republican, but competitive for years to come. Chris, uh, over this period of time, the number of Democratic seats on county commissioners' uh, boards dropped by 10%. But we haven't seen a corresponding increase. I mean, so, so obviously Republicans have, have gained ground, but we haven't seen a, a corresponding in, increase in the uh, number of registered Republicans in North Carolina so that they become the majority. What's going on? What does it mean? I, I don't know. I mean, I think John, I think clearly John has identified one of the trends, which is there are a lot of people in North Carolina that have been Democrats that have been voting Republican for a long time. Now they're, they're changing their registration to either independent or to Republicans. Uh, I think when you sift through all this, what we have is a roughly evenly divided state. And I think that uh, we are roughly half of people who are relatively conservative to moderately conservative, people who are roughly liberal to moderately liberal, people who identify with the Democrats half the time, you know, half the people identify with the Democrats, half the Republicans. I think that's when all this shakes out, we're, I think we're a very purple state. And that's why I think when we get when we finally get some common sense into both uh, parties in the General Assembly and stop gerrymandering districts all over the place, I think we'll have an evenly divided General Assembly. Cash, you cover this uh, journalistically across the state. Uh, answer this for me. Is the fact that the Republicans have gained state government, gained the governor's mansion, gained control of county commissioners, is it that the state is becoming more conservative, or do the Republicans just have better candidates? It could be both, but uh, I think there's something we're not looking at here. Over the past 15 years, and I think the census data uh, suggests this, we've had more people come to the state, move to the state. Many of these people, for the most part, have registered either Republican or Independent, and many of them coming from uh, uh, eastern states and out in the west are fiscally conservative, but they're socially moderate. So having lived here now for the better part of a decade, and all, a lot of these people now are running for, for public office. We see that here in Wake County, where we have a number of folks on, on the school board, for instance, who are from someplace else. I think that contributes to the numbers that, 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 that you're talking on about. On the Outer Banks, they say they, 
they come from off. <laughs> Gene, let's talk about the population trends. What does it say to you that 47 of the 100 counties lost population? Well, I think, and the, the greatest loss is in the northeast, and I would add to that and the, the border rest counties. of the, yes, yeah. the rest of the east also. There's been no growth there, and I, I think you will continue to see that. But I, I think we're getting away from defining people as Democrats and Republicans and more of moderates. Uh, your extreme right and left seem to be, to me, disappearing. And, and I think those are the people who are coming in and running for public office. Uh, it's refreshing, quite honestly, because most of the, uh, you know, for 110 years you had one, one choice, party, yeah. well, and, this and is, now at least you have a second choice. Well, this is part of the transition I was getting at. Is if you were in a county, let's say Johnston County, 20 years ago, many of those voters would have voted for Ronald Reagan. They would have voted for Republicans for other things. But they were but registered they voted, Democrat. Well, but it doesn't matter about registration. What they did, they were voting Democratic for county commission. Okay, they either had conservative Democrats they liked, or that was just what everybody did. Obviously, we're a Democratic state uh, or a Democratic county, but we might vote for a Republican for president. Now there's more idi uh, party cohesion. So Republicans will vote up and down the ballot for Republican candidates, even for county commission. Democrats will vote up or down the ballot for Democrats, and independents are willing to split, including re Republicans, for local office. Chris, one of the things that we're seeing is, is as you look at the map of where this growth is taking place, population growth is taking taking place. A lot of it is being clustered around our military bases. Mm -hmm. We're staring down the barrel of sequestration uh, next year. What kind of impact is that going to have on our state's growth, you think? Well, I think it'll have a, an impact on the economy. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham came and told us that. President Obama came to North Carolina and told us that. President Obama has told us that. I think uh, hopefully it'll be a short-term hit and people in Washington will come to their senses, although that's never a good bet to put money on. I was getting that, that to say. But I, I mean, I do think it's a, the, 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 the trends are fascinating. That I mean, the ID5 corridor... Uh, Wilmington, Asheville a little bit. It's real, North Carolina really is becoming urbanized. And we're, this, it's not going to slow down. I think, in fact, I think this pace will even increase as we go into the next decade. What was it? Hubert Humphrey said that Washington was 28 uh, square miles surrounded by uh, reality. <laughs> if you enjoy keeping up with what's happening in North Carolina, you'll enjoy our website, ncspin.com, and ncspin on Facebook. All during the week, our panelists and viewers sound off with their opinions of the week's events. So be sure to be part of the conversation with ncspin.com or ncspin on Facebook. And when we come back, we're going to talk turf battles. NCSPIN will return after these messages. Baseball players from other countries are considered guest workers here. Baseball, the previous administration and Congress cut a deal in 2006 allowing foreign players to travel freely across the country. Not so for agriculture guest workers. They're vilified for doing work Americans won't and they face a mountain of red tape just to get here. Shouldn't American agriculture get the same consideration as baseball? Farm Bureau and Agriculture, we keep North Carolina growing. North Carolina is a great place to live, work, and raise a family, but we consistently rank in the bottom third for state health. Poor health choices and inactivity cost our state $54 billion a year, dollars that could be saved through healthier living. We can do better, North Carolina. That's why NC Spin is working with health and community organizations to launch a healthier NC, an education campaign and challenge to live healthier lives. Join us at a healthiernc.com. We now return to NC SPAN. More than a dozen bills filed in this legislative session have set in motion turf battles between local units of government, but mostly between state and local governments. There's the battle over who should own and build local schools, how districts should be divided for voting, legislation to take authority away from Charlotte Douglas Airport and giving it to a regional authority, Legislation that prohibits towns from conducting building codes inspect in, uh, inspections beyond what the state requires. Negating the Dorothea Dix lease that we talked about last week. And there's always the fight over the actual water system. Chris, it's interesting that Republicans have always touted local control and uh, getting government out of people's way. And yet some of their actions this year seem to be a, a mount to nothing more than meddling in local government affairs. Do they feel that local governments are too powerful or do they just want to 
have power play over. Well, I think that they feel that some local governments have made decisions they don't agree with, and they've put aside their uh, feelings that uh, government closest to the people is best because they don't agree with the decisions that have been made. I mean, it, this has been one of the more surprising, uh, uh, I think, trends in this legislative session where uh, legislators, <laughs> and one of my favorites, uh, Senator Bob Rucho of Charlotte, T is telling everybody that the Charlotte Airport should be have governance from the entire region, and yet he's treating it as a local bill, which doesn't make any. So the governor can't have anything to do with it. Uh, there's, so there's a lot of hypocrisy at play here. Uh, I've heard for years, and a lot of Democrats have said this too, but Republicans really have been the champions of letting local governments decide what's best for them. In this case, is they're coming in case after case that you mentioned, they're coming in and, and trying to avoid these rules. I think it's terrible public policy. John, uh, Senator Tom Apodaca, Bob, uh, Tom Apodaca is saying that the cities are just too powerful. <coughs> Is that right? Uh, they were saying that until they reformed annexation. I think that was a taming of that particular set of lions. Uh, but, but that's another example but, of these turf battles, isn't it? Yes, but you, you were linking some things that were purely local things, like Wake County school board elections or the, you know, the, the Charlotte Airport thing, in with policy decisions that affect the whole state. For example, the proposal that's been around for a long time, and I think a good one, of reorganizing the relationship between school boards and counties across the state when it comes to school facilities. So for years, there have been many counties, this isn't just a local issue, who have said, we would like to integrate the management of our capital, you know, our parks and the buildings that we do. We think we're better at doing facilities and buildings and manage them, managing them. So what about having school buildings part of our real estate portfolio, letting school boards do education? That's not a local bill. No, but the other side of that, though, Gene, is that the, the legislature's getting into these battles about determining voting districts. It used to be that a county or a city or a municipality, somebody would come to the legislature and say, hey, we want to change the way we are districting our voting for city council or county. They're jumping right in the middle of it themselves right now. They have, and I think there's a great deal of a lack of respect by the General Assembly of the, of the counties and the local governments. Uh, and the counties and local governments are afraid to say something to the General Assembly because they control the money. And they are, are deadly afraid of the unfunded mandates that can come down to them. So it's like going to your banker uh, with your hat in your hand, and your banker doesn't like you in the first First place. <laughs> <laughs> That's Tom, never Tom, happened Tom, to you. Tom, no. Let's, let's, okay. But Tom, let's call this what it is. It's just point blank pure politics. All right. There's no reason for no. the general assembly to get involved in in, in how uh, districts are drawn uh, in Wake County schools when no one is asked for that except for the county commissioners who have a problem with them. And I find it appalling that here we have a general assembly that said, hey, Obamacare, we don't want any of that. We're going to take care of the people of North Carolina and not let the feds tell us what to do. Oh, by the way, Wake County, we're going to change your voting districts for you because it seems like a good idea. That, that, that is just plain appalling. Well, no, wait, wait a minute. No, you have so many districts that the lines do not even come close to matching. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a district that was for your local representative and a district, uh, and it, the same lines were for your representative? Yeah, but that's, that's, not, not, that's, that's not, not what they're doing. That's not what's going on <laughs> yeah. here, though, Jim. In fact, the districts in Wake County were, are relatively compact, and they were drawn by Kieran Shanahan, <laughs> Republican. a Republican lawyer hired by the Wake County School Board. Now the Republican, Republican legislature doesn't that's like right. the results, and they want to draw them again. John, I want to get back to this Charlotte Douglas Airport, because this is an interesting thing for me. Uh, they've decided they're going to take the control out of the city of Charlotte. They're going to grant it to a regional authority, and yet there's $800 million worth of bonded debt on this airport, and there are a lot of people, including the governor, who are saying, hey, slow down here. Let's, let's stop and figure there out are, all... There are conflicting opinions about how the change from a city airport to an authority would affect that debt. Some people who, who uh, analyze muni bonds say, no big deal. Some say, hold on a second. So I think it is something that's going to be carefully studied. Actually, that, that dispute originated with a young man who stowed away on an airplane, got in the wheel well in, at the Charlotte Douglas Airport, ended up dying, uh, probably upon landing or something when, that, when it was going to Boston. And then that became a dispute about the police to, uh, service at the airport and whether the city was managing that property right. so, because that was a security breach. Then there was pushback on that. So this began as a dispute about public safety. It has now become a dispute about the whole management of the airport, and I don't know how it's going to get resolved. All right, guys, so what, very quickly, let's go around the table. What's going to happen with these turf battles? Is this just idle conversation? Or is the legislature going to change the way that they're moving? Cash? Republicans are going to flex their muscle where they can. 
and, and it's not even just always partisan. It's people who are in power, haven't been in power, who want to do things that they want to do, whether it's the right thing to do or not. I think they'll continue, unfortunately. I think there might be some compromise on their parts, and they don't go, they, they stop as going as far as they have. John? I think some of these things may not happen, but it is true that cities and counties are creatures of the state. It's not the same relationship as the states to the federal government. The states create municipalities and have the ultimate authority over them. Justice matters. That's what we're going to talk about when we come back after these messages. NC Spin will return after these messages. Not all high school graduates go to college. Not all employers need college graduates. Are North Carolina's public schools preparing graduates with the skills employers need now? Join the discussion. Visit nceducate.com. We now return to NC Spin. North Carolina hasn't executed a person since 2006, but Senator Tom Goolsby has introduced legislation that could remove the barriers that stymied execution by allowing doctors, nurses, and pharmacists to participate in those executions without fear of recrimination from their licensing boards. His legislation would also abolish the Racial Justice Act. Cash, for years there was the accusation that Democratic legislators were trying to abolish the death penalty, but it would likely take a constitutional amendment to do it. Now the Republicans want to resume the executions. Is 2013 the year we're going to see this happen? I'm not sure because, as I understand it, we don't formally have a moratorium on the death penalty, but, we're, but rather we're, we're stuck in the courts. I believe there's some issues in some cases that are still making their way through the courts. So there's no way of knowing uh, when that's going to resolve itself. But clearly Senator Goolsby is trying to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, the Republicans never liked the Racial Justice Act. They gutted it. So really repealing it is just like throwing out some chicken bones right now. And and um, maybe he's hoping and putting pressure on, on the courts to maybe resolve this matter so they can repeal it. You know, we've done this show 14 years, and nobody has said <laughs> anything about throwing out chicken bones. John, That's a good analogy. It is a good analogy. Is. I made note of it. Uh, so far as it goes, let's, let's go to a point that Cash made in this. Uh, this is going through the courts. Now, if this legislation were to be passed, would the court battles be over and done with? I mean, if, if we said we were, we were going to remove any kind of problems from doctors, nurses, and, and pharmacists, uh, so far as their licensing boards were concerned, would that clear this whole it thing up? It absolutely would make the court cases moot. Because remember, none of these regulatory agencies on doctors, they don't have any independent authority. All their authority derives from the legislature. Right. So they're, ma they're basically claiming that under the legislature's action in creating these licensing boards, they have the authority to do what is essentially a, morator a de facto moratorium. And uh, if the legislature says that is not what our, we, that's not the grant of power, we, we are now clarifying our grant of power, that's it. Court case is over. Gene, a lot of people ha who formerly were in favor of the death penalty uh, and executions change their minds when they found out that it was costing the state more in the appellate process than it was to keep these people incarcerated for the rest of their lives. Now, if uh, the legislature and Senator Goolsby are effective in this legislation, uh, we're going to shorten the appellate process, take some of the cost out of that. Is that going to restore the faith of uh, the popularity of the death penalty? No, uh, I don't think it will. Uh, and and I, I think your your death penalty process was lasted 12 to 14 years before all of this started. Mm -hmm. But if you remember uh, the the latest News and Observer story that had uh, three pages, I think, on a man who was convicted and spent 34 years in jail. There's the problem. There are more people today, and particularly with the scandal uh, with the SBI lab, that people aren't ready yet to say, well, hold on, you haven't convinced us now that every person who is convicted is actually guilty. So I don't think they'll be able to do anything at least this session. Chris, one of the things that, that I, I, in reading this, Senator Goolsby said, quote, victims' families have suffered for far too long and it's time to stop the legal wrang wrangling and bring them peace and closure finally in their cases. Are, 
are, are what we're after here serving justice or just getting retribution for the victims' families? Well, that's a good question. That really goes to, the, I think, the heart of the death penalty. And there's, a, there's an organization called Murder, families, Murder Victims' Families for Reconciliation. There's a large group of murder victims' family members who have been through this horrible, un, unimaginable grief and, and don't believe somebody should be executed. They'd rather them stay in prison the rest and, of their life. And we're life. not trying to minimize that. That's right. That's, and and the, I think the, the, the victims' community is really split on that. And I'm a little, you know, I, I'm a little uh, surprised that Senator Goolsby believes he can speak for all victims and is sure that all of them think that way. I think another point to talk about the death penalty is crime in North Carolina is down. Murders are down. We've, we've been told for so long that the death penalty is a deterrent, uh, and it's really not. This is really not about that. In fact, last year in North Carolina, I'm pretty sure there was not one person sentenced to death uh, by a jury, and the death penalty was sought many times by DAs across North Carolina. So I think the death penalty is falling out of favor. I don't think there's a rush in the public to say, we got a lot of problems in North Carolina, and one of them is we're not executing But people. Cash, part of all of this argument focused around the fact that back in the 70s, we had a law that said uh, a death sentence was 80 years. A life sentence. Well, a life, life sentence, sentence was 80 years. And a person could get that reduced for good time. Uh, which ended up with some prisoners serving 35 years or so. Uh, we've done away with that now. In fact, the Supreme <coughs> Court just recently ruled that a life sentence is a life sentence for the rest of a person's life. D does, doesn't that remove a lot of the objections that people had uh, uh, for wanting to, to execute people? In, in some or, cases. Or not the objections that they have, but the, the reasons that they have for wanting to execute people. In, in some cases it may, but, but, but keep in mind this is political. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the exploitation of victims' families is really a, a, a political tool to a certain extent because, as we well know, the law and order crowd they're good for a couple of votes. And if you can get on their good side and get somebody to endorse you when you're running for office because you stood up for that murdered uh, victim's family, well, that, that, that gets you to the polls. Very quickly, I, I, we're running out of time, but very quickly, I just want to get a quick comment on the elimination of the Racial Justice Act. Uh, is this something North Carolina ought to do, John? Uh, I think Cash is actually right. It's been substantially changed. Uh, I think that is, there's no point in keeping it on the books in its current form. It doesn't have much force. Gene? I think it's a moot point now. Uh, the problem was using statistics in, on individual cases didn't work. Oh, I, you know, there was a case in uh, in Cumberland County where Richard. they just where they just used the district the statistics there and showed there were racial bias. I think we certainly need to keep it and get race out of the death penalty. I'm with my man. <laughs> All right. All right. When we come back after these uh, messages, we're going to talk about the lottery. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. North Carolina is a great place to live, work, and raise a family, but we consistently rank in the bottom third for state health. Poor health choices and inactivity cost our state $54 billion a year, dollars that could be saved through healthier living. We can do better, North Carolina. That's why NC Spin is working with health and community organizations to launch a healthier NC an education campaign and challenge to live healthier lives. Join us at a healthiernc.com. We now return to NC Spin. North Carolina state-sponsored lottery was born in controversy, and that controversy has continued ever since. Representative Skip Stam from Wake County has made no secret he'd like to abolish the games. But if he can't make that happen, he wants to remove the glitz and glamour from lottery advertising, forcing the ads to accurately show the odds for winning the large prize and inform citizens of both the lump sum payment as well as the amount paid out over time. His legislation would prohibit ads from high school and college events. Alice Garland, the, directory of the, lot, the director of the lottery, says the audits prove the games have been run cleanly. She's trying to maximize sales to benefit education. And in fact, a recent audit stated that for every dollar spent on advertising, we generate $32 in sales. Question one to Gene. Garland says most players understand the odds of winning are, are minuscule. Is she right? And is Stam's bill needed? 
No, I, I'm still trying to figure out where the glitz and glamour is in those commercials. I think they're awful. <laughs> However, uh, I think <laughs> that what what people uh, recognize, you, you're not going to win the big one, the 400,000 or a million, et cetera. But what they're playing is on a, maybe a weekless, weekly basis. And they'll say, well, I won today and I scratch off and I lost a little bit. But at the end of the week, am I ahead or behind in the game? And, and it's a small man's game. Uh, you, nobody wins the big one. You know, you can win. I understand the big prize by not playing just as easy as you can if you do John play. John and Chris, y y we've all been opposed to this lottery from the get-go. We said it was a sucker bet and so forth like that. There are a lot of people saying, hey, guys, it's time to get over it. The games are here. They're not going away. I don't think those folks have met us. <laughs> uh, to, to paraphrase Lamont Cranston, the shadow. Change you know, hell. Is that what you're saying? The weed of shame bears bitter fruit. We should never have put the government in the business of tricking people out of their money to pay its bills. We should still figure out a way to get out of that business. And in the meantime, we should at least stop deceiving people about the odds of winning. So how do you respond uh, to that? I, I, I completely agree. And I'm, I'm, Wait a minute. The two of y'all agreed. I, it is Easter Sunday. I, I'm appalled that, that we, we're trying to maximize our sales. That means we're trying to, get, we're trying to trick as many people as we can. We ought to have, if we're going to have the lottery, have it there. Don't try to convince more people to play. Have it there. Use the money for capital expenditures and, and be done with it. And I, agree, I completely agree with Paul Stam. I wish he'd have gone further. Yeah, Cash, education. I think the real question here <laughs> is whether or not the lottery proceeds are actually being used for education as designed. Design, or are they, as many suspected, supplanting funds that would already go to education? Well, first of all, not enough funds are going to education. I think that's been established. The formula they came up with, no one uh, understands. Let me go on the record and say, I agree with you. I wish they would get rid of it, too. I grew up in New York City, and you think the commercials are bad here. You should try New York, where they have a lot of uh, commercials, plus off-track betting. So I agree. It, it is a disgrace, and this state should never have gotten involved with it. Tom, I, I was there when we passed the lottery. And the argument, the big fight was not over whether or not the lottery was going to go in. It's what were you going to do with the money? Everybody wanted their piece of it. Ah. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback and read our weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. We hope you'll join us next week when we'll take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, hope you have a happy Easter. Stay informed. And watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.